very expensive. But of course, if you undersize the system, it will fail very quickly. And that's the tension with this type of system. And that's what you, I'm going to come on to in the next 15 minutes. How do you manage this issue of if you oversize the system initially, it will fundamentally lose you money. If you undersize it, the system will fail very quickly. Where, where do you find the point where it's, it's actually worked properly? It's not just the capital cost, it's the ongoing cost as well, the, the operational cost. You need to think about maintenance, um, that's planned maintenance, such as scheduled repairs to batteries, unplanned maintenance, um, a failure of a battery bank, um, a failure of a module in the array, Uh, you need to think about staff. Patrick. You need technical skill staff. This could be an investment of 60, 80, 100,000 dollars, the system. You cannot just leave that unattended. Yeah, that. That's a, a big asset that needs to be protected. You need village security for it. An energy company in the village to run and operate the system. And I'm going to talk about my experiences of doing this. So this is a map of Kenya. On the left, you can see in the green, this is where there is 2G or 3G phone coverage. I talked about the phone as being an important way of creating customers for the system. So clearly, I'm going to put my mini grid where there is a phone signal. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Yeah? So one of our location criteria is there must be a data signal. So we were in the green somewhere. The central map shows proximity to the, the national grid. So if you're red, you are within five kilometers of the national utility power grid. So I do not want to locate within five kilometers of the grid because there's a risk the grid will arrive and my system then becomes a stranded asset because it's competing with the grid. So the first system of the six we've done is a village of 3000 people just here there's Nairobi, the capital there. This is about six hours drive. And it's about 3000 people. It's an arid location, uh, quite low density housing. So the first thing we do is we go to a village and we talk to people and we ask them, we ask businesses, tell us about your typical day. How do you use energy at the moment? If we were to provide electricity, how do you think you would use it? And that enables me to build up a 24 hour load profile, an estimate of demand in the village. If all these businesses are correct in how they will, how they believe they will use electricity when we provide electricity in the village. Do you think there's any risk here with doing this? Can you see any risk with this approach? I'm talking to businesses and asking them, how will they use electricity if I provide it to them? The risk here is that businesses will overstate how much they will need because they want to appear to be successful. And they also have never used electricity, so they don't really understand it. So there is a question about whether this profile is correct or not. If this is wrong, I will oversize or undersize the system. And that's, that's the big challenge really.
understand the resource? Well, in this case, actually that's quite easy because it's solar. Uh, you can see this is kilowatt hours per meter square day over each month. And you can see it's very consistent. So photovoltaics is the, really the default option in this part of the world, very easy to design for. There's a very good solar resource. So the, the design principles I take, you should be able to maintain with local knowledge the system. Uh, in country supply chain, you do not want to be importing a battery from abroad if it goes wrong. That will create a delay of months. Uh, clean and maintain the system on site with local people in the village. Uh, the system should be resilient and therefore it should have system redundancy. There should be no one component which if it fails you lose the whole system. So I have twin redundancy at every point. If a component fails there's a parallel component which will still enable the system to work at reduced capacity. Think about the grid may arrive eventually, that's a risk. Can you design a system which can immediately take that grid connection and still operate? So our systems are designed in that way. Uh, we take a shipping container conversion approach. Ship containers are cheap, um, available everywhere, easy to convert, and a good create a good secure um, base for an energy system. Rainwater collection, use that PV canopy to collect rainwater because rainwater is, is a valuable asset in this part of the world. And we split the demands in the village into two blocks. The health clinic I classify as an essential load. So if the, if the energy system is struggling to meet demand, if the battery state of charge is dropping, it will disconnect the businesses automatically to ensure power goes to the health clinic to maintain the, the vaccines and the sterilization equipment for the health sensor component. So the businesses understand if the system is struggling to meet demand, they will be automatically disconnected. So I have a priority towards the health clinic. The system should be able to remotely control and monitor to repair it. I get information sent to my phone. If there's a fault with the system, I get a message and therefore I can go and log in and check the system. And we design for a 10 year battery life. The first system we've deployed, we added a diesel generator to reduce design risk. So if the battery starts to struggle with its state of charge, the diesel generator automatically starts and charges the battery back up. Uh, safety, um, systems designed in the UK will to be of a higher safety standard than systems designed in some of these countries. And that does create more cost. So that is a bit of an issue. So in summary, uh, in the system I'm gonna describe now, we have twin redundancy to uh, ensure, to allow for hardware failure. This first system is almost 10 years old. So it's lead acid battery. We are now swapping to other battery technologies for our more recent systems. It's designed for 28 kilowatt hours per day of demand. And this is for a village of 3000 people. We work at a low voltage DC for safety reasons. These people do not understand electricity or risk. So you do not want to be working above 110 volts DC because that's very dangerous. So we, we generally work at 48 volts DC and then we convert to AC for the distribution. All, all components are available in Nairobi for the Kenya systems and it's a shipping container deliver to site convert approach. So I use HOMA.
for my modeling of my off-grid energy systems. It's a US uh, cost optimization software for renewables. And you can see here from my modeling, the generator is expected to run a small amount each month, but most of the delivery is from photovoltaics. And this is the battery state of charge. So you, you do not want to take a battery below 30% state of charge because you shorten its lifetime. So here you can see we are typically holding the battery around about 80%. So that's very good for lifetime. And the software predicts a lifetime of 15 years. For the system, the one I'm describing here, we had to change the battery last week after eight years. So we didn't achieve 15, but we've got over halfway there. So this is a schematic of the, the system design. The photovoltaic array is to split into four blocks, one, two, three, four. So we have redundancy here. Four separate charge controllers, again, redundancy. And that, that DC power then feeds into the battery bank here, the 48 volt battery bank. When there is a demand in the village, the DC goes through to this inverter, produces AC, which goes to the grid. If this component senses the battery voltage is low, it switches on the diesel generator, provides AC to the grid and converts it back to DC to charge the battery. And that all happens automatically. Data is pushed to the internet uh, and then I can see it at work. So this is in the UK. This is the, the electronics being built and tested in the UK at our factory. And that's then shipped to site. Uh, this is lightning protection. You can see here, this is actually on site. This is the, the steel canopy. And here's our do not remove. <laughs> this is a piece of copper. This is valuable, but people need to understand this piece of copper is valuable because it makes the system safe against lightning risk. Do not remove it. So you have to provide education and training to people in the village, make it clear. Do not take this away, this lightning protection. The shipping container, uh, here's the, the hardware on the, on the canopy frame here. You can see this one here, it did not make it to site without damage. This was on the floor down here when I opened the container. And so this is the repair on site in the field, but the system still works. This is my data monitoring here. And on the left, this is the, the clinic. And on the right, these are the business loads. So here we're splitting the two, the two loads in the village. Here's my two data loggers. And then data is pushed through here to the internet. So this is the completed system in the village. This one contains the battery bank, the electronics, the diesel generator. This one becomes the, the community energy office. So here's the completed system. There's the rainwater collection. And these are businesses in the village here. So that's the view inside the shipping container, the battery bank. These are two volt cells, 24 in series, giving us a 48 volt DC battery bank. Charge controllers, inverters, distribution out through here. So DC comes in here from the canopy roof. AC goes out here to the pole distribution to the businesses. Our, our local contractor 
this is the AC distribution to a business in the village. So this is the AC cable going to a business here. This is not acceptable. Raising their eyebrows at me, really? Yes. So this is before the system is switched on connection. I see this. No, that is not acceptable. Do it again. So even if, even if I've appointed a local contractor who said they are a high quality electrical contractor, this is what was delivered, really important. Here's another image. Uh, that's a power, that's not acceptable. That's not safe. And so, you know, that has to be fixed. Um, this is the completed canopy, 14 kilowatt peak. And these are the businesses. I'm now going to show you some operation data about what happened. This is the demand profile, which I showed you, I estimated the village would have. And note, we peak at three and a half kilowatts. This graph on the left shows 2012 up to 2017, the annual demand profile over 24 hours. So you see demand goes up year on year. Okay, and we have a peak at around about 6 p.m. We'll go and come back here, which I'll explain later. The key thing is that after one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, the peak demand is 1600 watts. And yet my model that I designed the system to three kilowatts. So it's this thing that I'm a new designer. I've designed a system for three, never see three kilowatts. The system is oversized, oversized. And why is that? You know, is it because I do not understand what I'm doing, which is possible? Or have I made a mistake here? And this, this is the key issue, oversized risk. So this is the initial two year period. And you can see that demand is slowly increasing in the village. This is the maximum power, these red crosses, and you can see it slowly increases. So demand is going up, but it's quite slow with time. I'm gonna show you data here now for just over two years as an, as an average. So we're averaging two years worth of data to represent a single 24 hour period. So this yellow trace represents the irradiance level, the level of sunlight for a, an average day of 781 days. And you notice it's a beautiful bell curve. So unlike where I am at the moment, where there is, there is no sunshine, okay, just cloud, you can see here that the radiance levels are very consistent. Yeah. This is the generation from the four arrays, the four PD arrays, the average generation each day. You can notice they are not the same. So does this mean that array one is working and arrays two, three, and four are not functioning properly? No, it doesn't mean that. It's because the system is being underused, so the battery is always fully charged. So we do not need to use that generation from the from the roof. The system is oversized. Yeah, this is effectively lost. This gap here, this is lost electricity, which is never used because the system is oversized. And you can see it when you look at the battery voltage. 
It's a 48 volt battery bank. It's basically fully charged most of the time. Here is six in the morning. The sun comes up. We, we draw current from the photovoltaics. They charge the battery up. The charge controller then switches the array off because the battery is fully charged. So what this data shows us is that demand in the village is too low. I have oversized the system and the question is why? If we look at business opportunity in the village, we have one energy company, we have 79 businesses now, which is quite impressive, 45 of which have a direct connection to the energy company. They have a metered connection. We have a health centre, a maternity unit, a primary school, three churches, and a health healthcare staff quarters, all with electricity connection. And yet demand is still too low. Those businesses now include a chicken hatchery, hairdressers, cafes, bars, hotel, hotel. When I say a hotel, this is not a hotel as you imagine it. A hotel is somewhere where you can sit in the shade. It's not somewhere where you really stay overnight. Computer classes, battery and phone charging, uh, tailors, um, printing, copying, scanning, This is the lady who yeah. runs the energy company. Have five minutes uh, left, Professor Patrick. Five minutes? Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is the lady who runs the energy center. So she's the person who collects the money from all the businesses. Some key learning here. Initially, we were having a process where she would go every week and say to a business, you need to pay this much for this week. Those businesses refused to pay. So we had compliance of a bill payment of less than 10% initially. So we switched to a prepayment meters to avoid this problem. So wherever you do this type of system, you must use prepayment billing. Otherwise, you will have issues of non-compliance and non-payment. I said at the very beginning, the low profile was based on asking people. We see here, in 2013, businesses declared they were making very big profits. A year later, they declared their profits halved. That's because they believed we were charging them too much for electricity. And so they started to change their view of how much they were making as profit. Businesses declare that they are successful. They want to be seen to be successful even when they're not. So you need to be very careful when people self-declare how successful they are. Lots of community engagement. This is within the canopy discussing the system and how much people should pay for electricity. When this system was released initially, the price per kilowatt hour was almost 10 times the grid price because we we're trying to recover the cost of the system. We have gradually reduced the price per kilowatt hour and it's now three times the grid price. But people still complain that electricity is too expensive. Yeah. So this demand has grown after seven, eight years, but it's still much less than I designed for. I'm now going to show you a system in Uganda, which has the opposite problem. We have six systems. I've done one in Cameroon, three in Kenya and two in Uganda. They have different tariffs. The one in Cameroon, there is no attempt to recover any costs. Uh, the two in Uganda, we are forced to sell electricity at the grid price. They're the ones in red. That's a requirement of the government. The, the tariff must be the same as the grid price. The three in orange have full cost recovery. They're the ones in Kenya. What we see here 
is for these four identical systems designed for a limit of 28 kilowatt hours a day, the two in Uganda, the purple and the green, demand has grown really rapidly. Within two years, they've exceeded the design limit. Effectively, the demand has grown so quickly that the system is now failing because the capacity can't be met. The ones in Kenya, the cost recovery ones, demand is still nowhere near the design limit. So this is this tension about setting a tariff. So my key findings are, you must have excellent in-country supply chain, goods and skills. The batteries are still the weakest technical component by far. That's the bit which will fail. Businesses tend to overstate their success. So beware of self-reporting around energy demands. And you must have prepayment meters. Otherwise, you will not be able to collect the money. People will just say, I can't pay. Electricity demand is highly price sensitive. If you set the price too low, demand will rise dramatically, which is the blue line. You will exceed your design limit and the system will fail. That's what I see in Uganda. If you set the price too high, demand will stagnate and you'll never recover your costs financially. So trying to get this balance between the tariff is the key issue. You can find this paper, Open Access Online, which talks about this, this topic, of which I'm a co-author. Um, this is a picture of me in Cameroon installing a system. These are my co-authors. Thank you, and I'll look forward to hearing questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Patrick. This is very uh, on time. <laughs> you just spent exactly 40 minutes allocated thank you uh, for any uh, attendance here who would like to raise question we will uh, collect all of your question first in the link provided and then we will go to the second uh, lecturer today uh, then we will have discussion after yeah uh, so again thank you professor patrick but stay in there for another 40 minutes is it okay thank you yeah thank you very interesting yeah uh for um we will move to the second uh yeah we'll move to the second uh, lecturer today we have dr ruri agung wahyono uh he is a doctor from in the chemistry and abe and a base school of photonic uh, Frederick Schiller University, Jena in German. He obtained master of engineering, majoring in advanced functional materials, engineering and physics on, uh, from ITS. And also with the, this is, I don't think, I think it's wrong. This is from, Germ uh, he graduated from Japan. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, let me, let me use my screen. I think it, it, it is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he opened. Um, pardon? No, it's correct. <laughs> I got my uh, I got my master degree from ITS. From ITS and oh, okay, yeah. And um, he also obtained a bachelor of engineering, major in energy and environment engineering uh, from ITS with the summa cum laude and master with summa cum laude and a doctorate degree with magna cum laude. So, um, Dr. Ruri Agung, his um, research interest is more on the for education from electrodes for uh, electrons in the in German and also uh, working in Indonesia. So without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ruri to uh, share your presentation. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, many thanks, Bu Chanti, for the nice introductions about me. Uh, can you hear my voice? Yeah, all good. Yes, okay. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Uh, okay. So good afternoon, everyone. So also, I'd like to thank Global Engagement Center of IDS uh, for inviting me today. And in this occasion, uh, I'm going to share our experiences uh, with regard to the utilizations of renewable energy technology, particularly solar PV, to engage uh, sustainable living in our society. Uh, uh, wait a minute, I have a problem with my headset now. Uh, is my voice clear now? Yes, okay. Uh, is my voice Uh, so I will set my camera off because uh, we have a limited uh, quota of internet here so uh, to avoid unstable uh, I apologize in advance for turning my uh, Okay. So for today, I will discuss a little bit uh, about renewable energy in Indonesia and uh, especially emphasize the uh, quite urgent work in assessing the potentials of uh, energy sources to the renewable energy system. I will show you some previous works uh, for revisiting solar potential in Indonesia and discussing several cases uh, that particularly employ solar energy. Uh, but before that, uh, I'd like to thank my collaboration partner, uh, particularly Dr. Rido Hantoro and Dr. Gunawan from the Lab of Energy and Environmental Engineering uh, of Department of Engineering at ITS, and also uh, my collaboration partner from uh, the Research Group uh, at ITP Bandung particularly Mika, Mika Magenica Julian, who is pursuing his PhD at the University of Vienna, and also Dr. Kurpandono and Dr. Prasetya. And also my former lab mate, Aditya Kurniawan, who has supported all solar energy projects. So as we might already aware, that energy is becoming a global issue, right? As the, the crisis of fossil fuels and fossil energy emerge nowadays. And we still have actually significant reserves uh, of uh, oil, gas, and coal. But we also have abundant in reserve of renewable energy resources, which is, uh, I would say, considered as clean. And if you look at this chart, is that among all renewable energy sources, only using renewable energy, basically, that we harvest from the sun that we are talking today. We are capable of fulfilling uh, the whole annual world energy demand, but the current technology, the current solar cells, the political career, uh, social acceptance, economic or financing scheme, especially in uh, developing countries, uh, leads to a slow diffusion of these solar energy harvesting devices like solar PV to be acceptable uh, in society. So with regard to the uh, renewable energy utilizations in Indonesia is actually also committed to reduce in-house gases uh, up to uh, 
29% in 2030. So therefore, uh, renewable energy utilization is one of the priority activities using greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at the chart and also the tables on, on the right panels, among other uh, potential renewable energy sources, again, uh, utilizations of solar energy technology in Indonesia actually opens uh, several opportunities like the development of prospective low cost productions and fabrications of solar cells, which is technically applicable and environmental uh, acceptable. And now our Ministry of Research and Innovations also uh, put a lot of efforts yeah, uh, to drive, uh, to encourage the development of a solar PV based uh, project. And also uh, the potential of solar energy drives the solar PV power plant implementations for rural area to increase uh, national electrification ratio. But concerning the acceleration, accelerations of uh, renewable energy diffusion in Indonesia, as well as achieving the national energy mix target, uh, we need actually a renewable energy map, which is essential to provide uh, useful information to build renewable energy system. As we see in the diagram here, uh, the data of the specific renewable energy potentials on the left, on, on the left set, left side is required to uh, determine which conversion technology is needed. And eventually, uh, how to design the optimized uh, system using re a particular renewable energy. However, if we uh, take into account that climate change does exist, uh, wait, there is chat here. Okay, no, that's axis. So we, we need actually to update the map of renewable energy potential in Indonesia over the time, which is likely not the case at the moment, as it is the first critical step to design renewable energy system. And for this, my colleague from uh, ITB from Bandung and I have tried to provide a dynamic renewable energy map, including hydro and solar energy, but only solar energy is presented here, where we employ uh, historical meteorological and climate data, as well as uh, geographical information system or GIS. So now, uh, if we look, here, particularly, there was a work reported in uh, back in uh, 2012 by also our colleague Meita Rumbayan uh, from North Sulawesi uh, regarding the updated solar energy potential in Indonesia. And since then, the work was cited a lot, uh, sorry, and uh, considered as the reference solar energy potential. So basically our motivation was to prove whether this map is still valid or not because it is uh, quite essential uh, to design a solar power system so how our solar energy potential was estimated uh, solar power we, we know here uh, solar power the effective solar power is calculated by considering the potentially available land area and also the potential solar power uh, uh, solar power calculated from uh, solar irradiance. And as the uh, solar energy potential here is determined from solar irradiance, hence the solar irradiance in this work was estimated from uh, the sunshine durations. So we use this uh, mathematical expressions. I, I'm not gonna go through into detail in the calculus, but the basically we estimated the area irradiance from uh, the actual sunshine hour here and the maximum possible sunshine hour, sunshine hour and some uh, constants and also extra terrestrial uh, radiation. And for the uh, estimations of solar energy, we employed uh, S3 Arcis uh, GIS version 10 model builder and uh, 
daily energy output from a PV array is calculated using uh, peak hours formula. So, uh, but we need to take a note that this formulation means that the PV panel receives constant uh, irradiation uh, per day, which is modeled by a square wave function. And this leads to an overestimation of energy output of uh, PV array, since the power conversion efficiency of PV uh, declines at lower irradiation. And therefore, here on the uh, right side, uh, the radiative power flux uh, we calculate in this work was modeled as Gaussian wave instead of square wave. And to verify our model for estimating solar irradiation using sunshine uh, duration data, the Pearson correlation is evaluated and the uh, Pearson correlation coefficient between the sunshine hours here in the left, uh, in the X axis and the irradiations on the y axis uh, is found to be close to one. Uh, it is 0 0.964 and 4. And the uncertainty of this estimated irradiation tends to increase. If you look at the uh, dispersity of the data here with a greater magnitude of the sunshine durations. Also from uh, the total energy profile at the national level, uh, we evaluated monthly, as we shown in the, the right panels. We calculate both basically hydro energy potential and solar energy potentials, and we can uh, distinguish and uh, when the peak time of the dry and the wet season from the total national uh, solar energy profile in the right panel. So here, the peak dry season is likely in August and the the wet season or the rainy season is uh, mainly uh, i mean like the peak of the rainy season should be uh, between uh, february and march which shows higher uh, hydro energy potential here so if we look back at the solar energy potentials in indonesia uh, so is there actually a shift or a change of the solar energy potential map in Indonesia? So the answer, yes. And finally, it is confirmed that the profile of solar energy potential change uh, with the reference of the solar energy map, which was built uh, with, uh, by our colleague, Meta Rumbayan. And, it, and from this revised solar energy map, we actually have designed and in some cases, uh, build small scale solar energy system for uh, sea turtle conservations, uh, for solar boat and uh, solar drying. So now uh, we turn our discussions to uh, one of the solar energy projects that we have done. So we design a small scale off grid and propose an on grid solar PV system for turtle conservation in Banyuwangi, East Java. So this work was done in collaboration with the community of sea turtle conservation, which is called Banyuwangi Sea Turtle Foundation or PSDF. So uh, in principle, the PSDF, uh, they have uh, several egg hatching facilities and for their egg hatching facilities, they need extra electricity, uh, for example, for pump, uh, aerators, a heater, and also lighting. And at the moment, they, they at the time, yeah, it, it's back two uh, three years ago, at the time they use diesel yeah, to uh, generate electricity. And at the time, the, our observation leads to a proposal that we can build a small scale of grid solar PV system or micro solar PV system for current electricity uh, for uh, electricity needs at the time. And we can also propose actually a large, a large scale uh, solar power plant as the BSDF uh, is situated close to the coastal line. 
And here is the solar irradiance profile at BSTF using our models. Uh, we got a data as follows. The, an the annual average daily sunshine duration is actually uh, about six hours. And the highest duration of sunshine occurs in uh, September with a magnitude of uh, seven hours, almost seven hours, right? This is 6.97. So with this, we ha have estimated irradiations from 2.4 to 6 kilowatt hour hour per square meter per day and the average irradiations during wet season is around 4.58 uh, kilowatt hour per square meter per day and irradiation during dry season is around 5.03 kilowatt hour per square meter per day and that is estimated from the data here during the wet and the dry season which was already classified from our previous studies. Okay, from the solar energy potential information, we design a micro uh, solar PV system that only needs to supply 300 watt daily for each egg hatching facility. There, there was three, uh, the, uh, the, 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 yeah, three hatching egg hatching facilities, but we, we don't know at the moment how, how many hatching facilities they have. Uh, but for these systems, we require uh, three serial connections of PV panels and with battery capacity of uh, 120 ampere hours and operating voltage of 12 voltage by considering uh, all parameters for battery capacity design, including the days of autonomy, the type of discharge, the battery loss coefficient, and also uh, the nominal voltage of the battery. And if we look here are some documentations for our uh, micro solar PV project at Citadel Conservations. At the time, we involved uh, our students and engaged them uh, to take part in this project. And so basically the students also help us to build the uh, solar PV system, design the battery, uh, also all the electrical uh, system as well. Uh, furthermore, we also involve uh, local people there who work uh, in the vicinity of the BSDF to build and learn how the technology works, as well as we invite local authority from the Department of Environment of Banyuwangi, the, the local region there. And uh, the technical performance of one uh, unit micro solar PV we built, it only consists of three uh, panels. Uh, the power generated was in fact as high as the design output power, while the highest cell temperature can be reached, can, yeah, can reach up to uh, 60 centigrade at noon. And this is particularly important because uh, we need to design whether we, uh, we need additional cooling system or not to uh, improve the efficiency of solar cells. And yeah, for this, we also estimated uh, we also uh, give some explanations to the local uh, people there about the, the cost of energy. But unfortunately, the, uh, the price, the, the level of cost of energy for this PV battery system uh, is, yeah, in, in dollar is 20 cents per kilowatt hour with capital cost of uh, $587 and degradation rate of 0.5%. But yeah, still, unfortunately, the the LCOE uh, is still higher than the, the than that of uh, diesel power generations. And this higher LCOE of this full solar PV battery mainly originates from the huge amount of capital. Uh, for them, this capital cost is quite high uh, to purchase PV modules and batteries. But as the price of PV modules is decreasing, yeah, trend in the global markets, we expect someday that the LCOE of the, the PV battery system will be lower than diesel. But we don't know yet when it will be realized. And as I talked before, we also propose an installation of, uh, of on-grid solar PV system. Uh, in the in the vicinity area of uh, BSDF because it's close to the coastal line and uh, we define six 
area, considering that this area is not uh, used for uh, substantial uh, activities. And for our proposed on-grid solar PV system, using uh, we use uh, PV sys software, and the uh, simulation variables in the PV sys includes meteorological data, the incident uh, irradiance in collector plane that we already estimated using our models, uh, the incident energy factors, the PV arrays, inverter loss, and system operating conditions, energy use efficiency, and normalized performance index. As we can see in the uh, right panel here, there, uh, there, there are simulation parameters, but I will not discuss this in detail. Uh, the results from uh, our simulations shows that the total generated electricity from all six sites is up to 98.4 milliwatt megawatt hour per year, where the annual generator generated DC power is around 13K uh, megawatt hour, and the annual uh, generated AC uh, electricity is around also for around 14 uh, megawatt hour. So, the configurations uh, of solar PV system is different for each site, which you can see in the tables. But irrespective of the configurations, the peak performance occurs between, in between May and September uh, with constant loss within a year. And also, if we look at the performance ratio, uh, overall, overall the, the, perform, the performance ratio is above 70% for all sites. And if we, as we discussed previously, that the constant loss is present. So this constant loss originates from mostly uh, temperature and then irradiance level, array mismatch and other variables like degradations and wiring. But still, if we look at the estimated LCOE, the, the for full solar grid connected PV system, it remains higher than the, than the diesel-based solar uh, diesel-based power generations. But this LCOE was calculated two years ago. Uh, so considering the current uh, policy from the government, uh, it's probably need to be updated. So in conclusion, uh, for our first project, we uh, show that uh, in terms of solar irradiance model calculations derived from the sun-sun duration data, we actually need more validations uh, from other geographical side. But if, but from the uh, solar energy potential map that we have developed, uh, and we propose a grid-connected PV system by uh, occupying uh, 943 square meter from six possible sites we could generate up to uh, 200 uh, megawatt hour per year electricity that can use that can be used for uh, both ecological conservation in this case is sea turtle conservations and also for domestic use or for tourism activities in, in the in the seashore for example and the last uh, but not least yeah, we still have uh, several examples from our experience uh, we we now moving uh, to a bigger pro uh, object and a project basically uh, that we have studied hydrological model and gis based estimation for uh, hydro and solar energy potential in patimban area in west java so why patimban patimban uh, area is currently under rapid construction uh, for a deep seaport and uh, expected to be uh, operational by the end of uh, 2027. But notably, the Patimban deep seaport has been designed to have half of the capacity of Tanjung Priok port, uh, the largest port in Indonesia, also in the western of Java. 
And in addition, uh, the operation of Patimban port will be synergized with the Tanjung Priok port or other ports to meet the demand of the terminal capacity. So uh, if we consider uh, this large terminal capacity, uh, the Patimban port likely requires huge energy for their operation, uh, particular electricity. Uh, if we compare with Tanjung Priok port, which consumes energy up to uh, around 60 uh, million kilowatt hour supply, which is supplied by private energy supplier. So we estimate that the Patiman port will also require at least uh, 30 uh, million kilowatt hours per year. So basically our objective was to map the potential of energy sources in the Patiman area by integrations of geospatial data sets uh, and climatological data in GIS and hydrological model. So if previously we developed uh, GIS space for and also uh, climatological data, uh, climate data to estimate solar irradiation. Now we integrate with hydrological model that use slope and streams of uh, slope, yeah, to calculate the head, to calculate the hydropower, and also from the flow rate in the river. So, yeah, as I said before, the the hydro energy potential is estimated from both head, which is calculated based on the different elevation from uh, digital elevation model. We, we see the topographical image of all area in Indonesia on the above panel here, and the flow rate from the stream model. While the solar irradiation uh, was calculated using the same procedures that we have discussed before. And for this, we have identified uh, 49 potentials sites of hydropower, which is mainly classified as uh, microhydro, where hydropower potential sites range uh, from 0 0.1 uh, to uh, 54 kilowatt hour with an average value of 5.5 kilowatt hour. But if you look here <coughs> for the solar energy potential, the irradiance only spans between 3.49 and 3.63 kilowatt hour with an average of 3.59 kilowatt hour. And the potential of this irradiance actually below the, uh, the average of national solar irradiance. But if we look uh, at the total potential of solar energy that can be harvested from the available sites classified from the land use type, you can see in detail in the, on the right uh, panel there's a table here, we classified land use type, and we also estimate effective area for solar panels and eventually uh, estimate the total solar energy that can be produced from the area. And we have found that the maximum of, well, that's quite a high number, right? 4,650 million kilowatt hour per year that can be obtained using the effective area of a department area. And if we compare with the annual energy required for, uh, for the operational of a uh, Pettiman port, uh, so this 4,600 uh, 4, million kilowatt hour is uh, roughly 150 times right, uh, of the, uh, the total energy need annually for Pettiman port. But then, as this solar energy project is quite high, I mean, high and huge, quite quite high in in terms of a capacity, also in high uh, in terms of cost needed to build or to uh, realize this project. And now the question is uh, how to finance this renewable energy project if our proposal is accepted, which we don't know actually. At the moment, what what is the plan of the uh, the local government uh, and local ministry, uh, or and and the and, and the corresponding ministry that is respons responsible to build this port? Uh, but the only possible way is to financing this project shall be involving uh, a public 
private partnership program yeah, uh, which is under the presidential regulation number 67 uh, year 20 uh, 2005 and other presidential regula regulations number 38 year 2015 because this uh, public private partnership program is allowed to build infrastructure including for renewable energy projects so this is likely the the only possible way that we uh, that that can finance this this huge uh, solar pv project if our proposal is accepted but then in conclusions uh, that we have implemented the uh, uh, the development of a renewable energy map including hydro power and solar energy map, energy map using a hydrological model and a geographical information system and also climate data but then for this project at Patimban port we have found that the hydropower plants the potential of a hydropower plant is not sufficient uh, to support uh, ne uh, the annual energy need in Patiman area. But fortunately, uh, the abundant uh, sunshine hours in Patiman area can potentially produce 150 times, as I mentioned earlier, 150 times of the approximated energy demand in the Patiman deep sea board. Uh, so, Okay, so I still have five minutes, I guess. Yeah, then uh, I would like to show another example on how solar energy could help our society. So we have had a solar boat project. Our colleague, Dr. Rido Hantoro uh, from Engineering Physics, uh, developed solar boat for fishermen uh, which was already tested uh, four kilometer back and forth with a speed of approximately two meter per second and they found that okay this is fine and uh, this could be helpful for the uh, fishermen but at the moment the this solar boat cost about uh, five thousand five hundred US dollar which is quite expensive but but considering that the the fishermen uh, can reduce their spending on buying diesel, which is quite scarce at the moment. Uh, this solar boat project might be promising in the future. Yeah. And the last examples that I want to show you here is the utilization of solar energy for solar drying. So we use both solar uh, solar cells for uh, electrifying a small uh, fan to blow uh, the, the, uh, the fish here in the solar, dry, solar fish drying chamber. Uh, and in this case, we, we have helped the fishermen to build solar fish drying chamber that can help them dry their fish faster and make their work more efficient. So uh, from our experiments, we could help them to improve the quality of the dried fish uh, uh, by reducing the moisture content from 70 to 50% uh, of moisture content, uh, content, and then also reduce their time for drying from 10 hours to five hours only. Okay, I think that's all the experience that I can share regarding how we can harvest solar energy and to use that for uh, our daily life for industrial, for society in, uh, in a coastal area and also for ecological uh, conservations. And yeah, I think that's all. Then I turn back the, the sessions to the moderator, Pujanti. Uh, thank you very much, Ruri, uh, and also Professor Patrick for very interesting um, sharing here yeah, today. Uh, we are at the, we are, I am a deputy for Sustainable Development Goal Center in ITS. So since 2020, 
the government commit to like uh, the government already adopt yeah acknowledge uh, about the how to reach the sustainable development goals and ITS established the sustainable development goal center in 2020 and we would like to engage more with uh, you and with some of the our friends here how to accelerate um, the the um, fulfillment of uh, of the goals so we already have several questions here uh, i would like to share with yeah from sifa alina amri uh, to uh, professor patrick uh, sifa are you here do you want to read it or do you want me to read hello can you hear my voice yeah yeah you can read it yourself uh, all right then uh, good afternoon everyone my name is shifa Amri from its so my my question for um, professor patrick James was um in the technology that you've developed uh, are you oriented towards the villages being self-sustaining in the future and how accessible is the technology for locals to be able to operate themselves Thank you. Yeah. I would like to add to her question, Professor Patrick, if you don't mind, so you can answer in once. Uh, sure. If you look right. at the, uh, <laughs> yeah, if I look at the uh, Africa case, it's very interesting how, you know, they progress a lot. But in Indonesia, the regulation is there and sometimes it's changed, like it changed. So, so what's the key of um, promoting this uh, renewable energy, especially solar, uh, for the rural community as well as um, in Indonesia situation, the energy is uh, managed by, the distribution of energy is managed by PLN, the monopoly uh, state-owned enterprise. Yeah, so I would like to hear your comments on her question as well as my question, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I don't have a particular preference in terms of technology. I'm interested in delivering um, or hours of electricity for productive use. So I don't have a particular preference over lead acid batteries versus um, some new iron phosphate battery, for example. Uh, I, I just view it as a battery which can process this many kilowatt hours at this price. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, technology and, and, and risk, in the context, actually, the battery is the, by far the greatest risk. By far the greatest. That's where we see our failures. Um, the DC side of a PV system, really, um, you do not need the, the skills in the village is literally the skill to basically ring up the central office in Nairobi and say the inverter has two red lights. And they will say, OK, either do this or we will send an engineer out tomorrow. So. PV in terms of maintenance is really elegant. No moving parts, as you know. Um, the, the skills is understanding the battery risk. So someone in the village can identify battery risk and and um, and starting to see a failure. Yeah, that's how I see things. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In terms of the yeah. grid and monopoly, yeah, that's the same in Africa. It's exactly the same issue. And you are not allowed to connect a PV system to the central grid. That, that's not allowed at the moment. But interesting, we have another project. We are, about to, we are about to connect within the next month the system I talked about to the national grid. So it's going to be a, a grid connected system the grid is very unstable here. It's probably down about 30% of the time. So I didn't talk about this in my talk, but the grid in Kitanyoni 
the uptime is 99.99%. It's incredibly reliable. And the local grid is only up 70% of the time. So we have another project looking at how the two things can work together because they will have to connect eventually. But I think your problem is the same. At the moment, you're not allowed to connect. Uh, we allow like now um, uh, PLN just uh, just starting from few years ago, three years ago, uh, we have the export import system, but it's not well promoted because I think it's kind of from my own perspective, uh, it's kind of a dilemma probably for PLN. Uh, at one hand, they have to buy and also the grid is not is not designed to receive the, the energy. So I don't know what's the solution for this <laughs> because I'm not an, an engineer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But probably uh, learning from, also learning from uh, Africa case, maybe uh, lots of, in some case, they are successfully implemented also, but on the other case, like we, some people not willing to pay maybe also in Indonesia that will be the same yeah yeah so thank you uh professor patrick so i will move to the next question yeah uh the next question is uh what is the longest running project you have worked on in africa and which stage is the most time consuming also uh, is the only PV renewable energy suitable to be applied in Africa at this time? From Alfan Afan, Alfan Afandi. Alfan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, yeah, okay. You should treat it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm interested on some, pro uh, some of your projects in Africa. Uh, I have two questions. First is, what is the longest running project? you have worked on in Africa and which state is the most time consuming? And the second question is, is it the only renewable energy PV that is suitable to be applied in Africa for now? Okay, Thank you. Good, question. good question. So <coughs> in terms of um, resources, certain parts of Africa have very good wind resource yeah and also hydro but if you uh, if you're saying okay I want to have a technology which I can move around almost all of a country you're going to choose solar but there will be sites where it will be more appropriate to put a small wind turbine up as well or a hydro scheme but a hydro scheme, you have to do an awful lot of pre-planning and assessment and understanding the resource. Solar is very easy in comparison. Yeah. So Kitanioni, the system I talked about most today, that's it's now running in its ninth year, and that's our longest system. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, I also sir. have questions yeah, to Professor um, Patrick Bujanti, if I am allowed to yeah, ask. Yeah, 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 welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I also want to ask questions to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, I have found interesting because uh, Professor Patrick also worked closely to Professor Bahad. We did it. So basically, uh, have initiated a collaboration with much. I think he's also working under uh, Professor Bach's group, right? Uh, for uh, yeah, well, uh, the new town fund, but we, we haven't successfully uh, uh, going through the, the next stage. On uh, but considering your projects in, uh, in the solar PV uh, power plant in Africa, you, you say that you your design PV system was optimized compared, compared to the load oversized. The, the solar PV was oversized. The oversized compared to the load, right? So, so how do you manage the excessive electricity generations there or does it affect the battery system, basically? 
there yeah, so the, the system is oversized and you can say that's my, my mistake or my error, yeah, as I talked about. Because it's a standalone system, all of that generation is essentially lost. The charge controllers disconnect the PV. And so there, it's all that potential generation is lost. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is there any potential to build like a smart grid there? I mean, like to build like a local grid and local grid there and connect between the uh, small scale PV system there? So we have I'm another project at the moment where we are looking to join mini grids together and connect them mm -hmm. to try and share the demand. Yeah, to try and smooth out this effect. Yeah, so we get better utilization. And it's still, the, is it still running at the moment? Yes. So okay. all of the, the grid systems I showed you, mini grids I showed you, they're all running now. Okay. Yeah. Do you no use also micro grid management or not there? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Do you like uh, like the the all the grid is uh, in the micro grid, are they, or connect to the main grid? Okay, so our new project, we are connecting uh, the kit and yoni system to the national grid. Okay. okay, and our two systems in Uganda, we are linking them together, so we're joining two mini grids together. So there's a two-way power flow between the two grids. They are two kilometers apart. And it's managed by uh, private or government? So the one in Kenya is managed by the, the utility now. It's operated by them. Uh, the one in Uganda is effectively run by the utility, yes. But it's a standalone system. Mm. What's the motivation for like, what's the driver for them to be willing, seriously uh, manage this type of uh, solar energy uh, battery? Because I would say that um, compared to the large community, maybe it's not, it's not big income for them. Yeah, uh, so yeah. How, how to promote this? Okay, that's a very good, question. I'm going to try and use my headphones so I can hear you better. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you were, asked, you were asking the question, what's the motivation for the utility to do this? Why should they be involved? Yeah. Grid extension yeah, for them. Because we want them to be involved, but in Indonesia, you can see that they are serious about this. <laughs> yeah, so, so gr grid extension is incredibly expensive for the government to do. Yeah. And, but they have these very strong targets that they are going to provide energy access for all. And this grid extension to very low density rural areas, it's cheaper for them to look at doing mini grids. It's not about them making money in terms of from selling kilowatt hours. It's a, it's a less expense for them. Mm, it's a cheaper mm. solution, ultimately. Yeah, it is cheaper solution, but maybe, yeah, I think uh, I agree. That's why I want, uh, yeah, thank you. I also want to ask uh, Pa Ruri yeah, <laughs> to respond to Professor Patrick that, uh, in like in paper in calculation it seems feasible economic so what makes this uh, not not as fast as implemented as in theory i mean I'm, i mean like the, the reason for our society is quite clear actually uh, the first is social acceptance and because they they are not, uh, first they are not really aware with technology so basic, basically, we need to uh, educate our society first, so that they, they can accept the, the, the new technology for, for, for their 
And then the second is the, the high initial cost for renewable energy. Even, even people who, who is considered uh, like a middle class, a middle upper class, they, they always consider, ah, that's too, cost, too costly to, for example, uh, to install a solar home system. Okay. Right? So, so that's typically the, the, the barrier for the, the, the rapid diffusions of this uh, solar PV in our society. But for, for a bigger project, I think that more political, right? Uh, because our, our government uh, regulation is not, uh, uh, what should I say, it's not fit, so it's keep changing, changing, and changing. So, uh, I mean, the uh, private sectors who are not entirely sure if they want to invest their money to, to build a big project, for example. For example, for Patiman, uh, Patiman Deep Seaport, actually, it's very feasible, I mean, legally, but I'm not really sure economically if it's feasible with our current government. Yeah. Because we con I, uh, I have a student who uh, conducted the research about the community acceptance uh, of solar energy uh, in, for, for housing. And they, the respondents uh, suggest that the PLN should have the kind of joint venture with some contractor, then make the make more acceptable uh, model for the housing owner, like the residential owners to invest, <laughs> to make sure, and also for the businesses to, to invest. Maybe we need to develop a new model for Indonesia. But uh, I still have one question from Muhammad Aryo. Are you here? Muhammad Aryo Aji? Hello? Okay, I read it, I read it for you. Uh, in the future, how to not, uh, for Professor Patrick, in the future, how to not lose as much capacity in the converter? And also in your project in Africa, what about the potential energy uh, for the future in Africa? Can you repeat the first bit? I didn't understand. <laughs> uh, how to not lose as much capacity in a converter? Oh, in a converter? Yeah. In converter. In converter uh, make some energy lose it? I don't know. I think so it's only converter, isn't are, it? are we talking about the, 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 the DC to AC? That's the DC to AC, yes. 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 Okay, so in the system the system I talked about, we have, we use a Victron unit, which is a, which is an inverter charger. So it works both ways. It converts DC into AC. Are you hearing a really bad echo? I'm getting it. No. It converts DC oh, into yeah. AC, and it can all, and it can also take the AC from the generator and convert it back into DC. So it works both ways. So it's quite a clever piece of equipment. So we lose about 10% converting DC into AC, yeah? The question is, in the future, how to not losing? Is there any new technology? How to not lose this 10%? Okay. So what you could do, potentially, is you could say the whole grid is DC. We don't have any AC, we just provide DC and DC appliances. So that's more efficient. The problem is, is that DC appliances, such as a DC television, would be more expensive than an AC television. Yeah. And these people have very low incomes, a few, few hundred dollars, US dollars per year. Um, and so, the marginal cost between paying $40 for a television and $70 for a television, that's a massive jump. It's not affordable 
So people want to use standard AC appliances. So we could go all DC and that would improve the efficiency, but it wouldn't, it, it would be a real barrier for people to use appliances. And the supply chain in the country is, does not have these appliances because there's no market really. That's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it answered the first question. The oh. second question is about uh, what do you think about the future energy of uh, Africa? Will they use more on uh, solar energy or other, as you mentioned before, they have uh, several sources of renewable? Uh, yeah. Uh, so solar is in many parts of the world now is the cheapest option for bulk large scale generation. It's cheaper than fossil fuel. Um, so I would I would see in sub-Saharan Africa that large scale solar really makes sense. So that complemented by uh, winds where appropriate, potentially geothermal in the Kenya context. Um, but realistically, large scale solar really makes sense in that part of the world. It's in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour, it's it's price competitive now. Yeah. Uh, Ujanti, probably you, you need to unmute your... Oh, yeah, thanks, Professor Patrick. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unmute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I was oh, mute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor Patrick, for, for uh, responding the questions. And last question for uh, Dr. Ruri about what's your view about Indonesia? Um, or Indonesia and also how we uh, probably look from the Africa case and how we learn about the cases, yeah, successful uh, in other country, including our neighbor. Philippines is progressing a lot compared to Indonesia, but yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the questions, Bu Janti. And but actually, actually, uh, Indonesia is now rapidly progressing in 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 terms of utilizations of solar energy. But uh, we we already know that uh, the government is seriously uh, building. The, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's like thirty five thousand megawatt uh, solar PV power plants in the eastern part of Indonesia, and I think in terms of solar energy, uh, in terms of renewable energy potentials, which is uh, potentially uh, available throughout the year, solar energy potential is the best, right? Because only intermittency is, is the, the key problem. But for, for example, for a hydropower system, uh, geothermal, wind energy is always site specific. So I, I mean, my point of view, solar potential is still promising for Indonesia. But to, to yeah to learn to learn from the case in uh, Sahara Africa, uh, I think uh, yeah the government I mean in our culture the government needs to engage uh, more uh, engage more like giving incentives to uh, for example uh, for the households who want to uh, install solar home system. And we know that, as you say, PLN has to buy like electricity, which is generated from solar home system. But the, I mean, the, the system is not. I'm, I'm not really sure it, it is already compatible. Or not, but I mean, like uh, the system is still developing. Uh, but it should be successful to invite uh, private sectors for a solar project. I mean the, the key the key uh, party to uh, I mean the key party that that responsible I would say is the government to uh, to release uh, uh, favorable regulations uh, to 
to private sector to invest their money into a solar PV project. I think that's 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 in my point of view. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we are at the end of the uh, uh, guest lecture series. Uh, I would like to, on behalf of the team, I would like to thank for a very inspiring uh, story and also sharing your knowledge here, uh, Professor Patrick and uh, Pa Dori. Yeah, so I leave this back to the MC. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Danti, for conducting this amazing session. And thank you very much, Professor Patrick James and Dr. Rory for the excellent lecture today. Please give applause to our speaker and moderator by using the Zoom reaction feature. Furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to both of our speakers and also our moderator. First is the certificate presented for Professor Patrick James. Next is the certificate presented for Dr. Ruri Agung Wahyuono. Last but not least is the certificate presented to Dr. Yanti Gunawan. Once again, thank you very much to all honorable speakers and moderator for your availability on today's guest lecture series. Before we end our lecture today, we invite you all participants, as well as the honorable speakers and moderator to take a group photo. To all participants, please open up your camera. We are going to wait for a few moments until our participants open their camera. Okay, as we have two slides here, so uh, to everyone, please keep up your smile until we finish our group photo. Now I will count to three. One, two, three. And moving on to the next slide. One, two, three. Now we have finished our group photo. And then for the participants, please fill the feedback form through the link bit.ly slash feedback GLS that you can also see on the Zoom chat room. The deadline for filling the feedback form is one hour after we finish this session. We want to remind you that the participant who will get the stamp for it is the participants who come on time, join this event until the end and also fill the feedback form. Finally, we have reached the end of today's guest lecture series and we sincerely apologize for any mistakes we may have made in presenting as Masters of Ceremony and Committee. Thank you very much to our honorable speakers, moderator, and all participants for the attention and cooperation. We will see you in the next guest lecture series on SDGs next as we will have one session on Tuesday and two session, uh, two parallel session on Wednesday. As for the session in Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, we will have a topic, quality education for all critical and political perspective that will be delivered uh, by our speaker, uh, Dr. Miguel Antonio Lim and Dr. Arfan Fahmi. And for the first stream of Wednesday session, it will be the SDGs in solid waste management, paradigm shift in waste conversions to wealth, and semi-decentralized of solid waste management that will be delivered by our speaker, Dr. Pramila Tumunaidu and Dr. Warma Dewanti and Dr. Dian Septarini as our moderator. And for the second stream, there will be the topic supply chain management digital, digitalization, supply chain post COVID-19 that will be delivered by Associate Professor Ferry Chie. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Patrick. Thank you, Pak Ruri. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Everyone. In five, four, three, two, one. Thank you.